Hello uh, and welcome back. In this video we're going to be talking about conventional ethical relativism. Conventional ethical relativism. It's also known as cultural relativism by some. Um, so you might hear me using both terms. Now uh, conventional relativism or cultural relativism is the notion that, uh, th that moral principles or morals, ethics, things like that come from individual cultures. It's the notion that each individual cu culture has its own sort of uh, its own worldview, its own language, maybe its own uh, cultural perspective, and uh, each one of them have their own also have their unique moral code. Now there may be some overlap between cultures, but ultimately whether whether something is right or wrong depends basically on on the culture within which it takes place. Uh, that's the that is the uh, the notion of cultural relativism or conventional relativism. Um, each society has its own idea of right and wrong. Now, this is uh, this is a a form of relativism, and what we mean by relativism is the is the idea that there are no such thing as universal moral principles. Uh, conventional relativism believes that. In fact, it's going to offer an argument in order to try to prove that. Uh, but uh, but uh, there's no universal moral principles. However, the individual could possibly be wrong in their moral in in their morals and in their ethics if what they believe about morals and ethics conflicts with their culture, the culture in which they live, because that culture has uh, has a that that society has formulated its own system of morals, its system of taboos, in order to provide for the cohesive operation of that society. So every culture, individual culture, has their own idea of right and wrong. The argument that is advanced by Ruth Benedict uh, for cultural relativism is, is as follows. It's based on two premises, and the conclusion is there are no universal moral principles. So that's what conventional relativism is trying to prove. That's what Ruth Benedict is trying to prove, that there's no such thing as universal moral principles. Now, the two premises are these. The first one, premise number one, is known as the diversity thesis, the diversity thesis. And the diversity thesis says that different cultures have different moral practices. Different cultures have different moral practices. And in order to substantiate this, although I think at first it, it might seem like it's simply self-evident, right? But in order to substantiate this, Benedict offers her uh, offers an example from Herodotus that she draws from an ancient Greek historian named Herodotus. Now Herodotus uh, was giving an account of the the court of King Darius. King Darius was a Persian emperor and he ruled over various people groups, different different groups of people. Uh, he, he, his kingdom extended as far as some Greek city-states uh, that were uh, I believe on the on the uh, western Aegean, I'm sorry the eastern Aegean Sea. So there were Greeks who were there and then all as far over as is uh, in reach to different different groups in Asia as well. And one such Asiatic group was known as the Calatians. Uh, so there were the Greeks and the Calatians, and both of them were present in the court of King Darius on this particular day. And Darius looks at the Greeks and he says, he says, what do you do in your culture in order to, tr in order to bury the dead or in order to uh, do, you know, deal with those who have passed on? And the Greeks say, well, King Darius, this is what we do. What we do in our culture is that we wash the, the, those who have died, we wash their body off, and we lay them out on a funeral pyre, which is kind of like a table that's surrounded by a lot of flammable objects, right? We lay them out on a funeral pyre, and then we take and we lay, we, we, we place over their eyes, we place two silver coins, one over their left, one over their right. Uh, now, when we do the, after we do that, we burn the body, and uh, and and then uh, you know we do several type of ritualistic type things as well. Um, well, the Calatians hear this, and they are they are basically undone. They can't believe what they've heard. They they're sort of they're they're sort of like aghast at what has just been said. And uh, Darius looks over and he says, "Well, what about you from the Calatians? What what do you do in your culture when someone that you love dies?" And they say, oh, King Darius, we, we would never burn them and, 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 and let them go to waste like that and, and do something so dishonorable to them. Uh, no, instead, what we do with them is we, we consume them. We eat their flesh. Uh, 
we eat the eat the body of, of the one that that, uh, that that has died that we loved and we seek to honor. And of course, you can imagine how the Greeks felt about cannibalism, right? Well, anyway, Darius kind of shrugs his shoulders and looks, you know, looks and says, "Well, I guess, I guess culture is king. So to to uh, to burn the dead for the Greeks was the the moral thing to do, but for the Colossians that was the immoral thing to do. To eat the dead for the Colossians is the moral thing to do, and the immoral thing for the for, for the Greeks to do. And so, uh, and and so basically, um, th there are no, you know, different cultures just have different moral practices. Uh, can't." say anything other than that, right? So that's the d diversity thesis, and it seems to be almost self-evident. It seems to it seems as we look across the world today, we look at different cultures, we look in different um, we look in different places throughout the world, and it, it seems to be almost self-evident that yeah, the different cultures have different moral practices. Well, that's premise one. Premise two is what's known as the dependency thesis. The dependency thesis, and the dependency thesis says that whether an act is right or wrong depends upon the culture within which it takes place. Whether an act is right or wrong depends upon the culture within which it takes place. Um, uh, to give you an example of this, maybe uh, we could ask ourselves the question, is it, moral, is it moral for women to drive a car? Now, that seems almost an absurd question to ask. It's like, it's almost um, it's almost sexist to to um, to suggest otherwise, right? Uh, in in the United States, so long as a woman has uh, the proper credentials, the you know, proper insurance, her car is registered, she's got she's got a driver's license, uh, then there's no problem whatsoever. As long as everything's legal and in order, no problem whatsoever for for a woman to drive a car. However, if you would have if you would go to Afghanistan, say maybe five or six years ago. Uh, the same could not be true. Now, I've heard that they are making some um, reforms since then, but it was illegal at that point for women to go, not only to drive a car, but basically to even just go out in public unescorted by a man. If they went into public without their husband or their brother or their uncle or some male relative who was there to escort them, if they were in public without that escort, they could be caned in the city streets legally. That was a, a punishment, a punishable crime. Uh, so it is immoral in that, in that society for a woman to drive a car. It's perfectly fine in this society to drive a car. So, the, so whenever you ask if something is moral or not moral, well, according to moral relativism, um, in order to answer that question, according to cultural relativism, you have to ask, well, where is this action taking place? Is it taking place in a culture that approves of this? Or is it taking place in a culture that does not approve of this? And and uh, that's the, that's that's where we get our idea of right and wrong. It's from the culture. So uh, the diversity thesis, uh, premise number one, says different cultures have different moral practices. The dependency thesis, thesis number two, says that whether an act is right or wrong depends on where it takes place or the culture within which it takes place. And from that, from that, Benedict Ruth Benedict concludes. Because those are true, then there are there are no such thing as moral principles. There is no such thing as moral principles. Um, well, is that a sound argument? Is it is it valid? Is it sound? Is it true? Let's uh, let's take a look at it a little bit more closely. Uh, let's start off first by uh, looking at the the two thesis, uh, the two premises first. Uh, premise number one, the, div the diversity thesis says different cultures have different moral practices. Well, as we've outlined, it seems to be self-evident that, that they do, but really, do they really? Um, because if you think back to the, the, the example of the Greeks and the Colossians, Yes, they had different moral practices in the sense that they did different things, right? One, one group ate the dead, the other group, uh, the other group burned the dead. Um, they did different things, and so they, their practice was different. But the undergirding moral value that drives that practice seems to be very similar. James Rachels is one that has come out and talked about this. And what he believes, or what he says, the, the challenge that he extends towards cultural relativism at first is this. Uh, that it does seem, on, uh, at first glance, that they're different, and, and it's because the practices are different. 
But those practices are both driven by a common set of values. And what's more important than the moral practices is the moral values. And every culture has a, a very similar set of moral values. Let me, let me give you the example how he explains it. He says, uh, think about the Greeks and the Colossians, right? Uh, the Greeks, why do they burn the dead? Well, the Greeks burn their dead because, uh, because in the Greek worldview, uh, matter is bad, spirit is good. Matter is evil, spirit is good. The, this body of matter is basically a prison for our spirit. And so for the Greeks, in order to, to ex expedite the, the, uh, the loved one's migration to the next plane of existence, they, their spirit has to leave their body. And so, that they, so they would basically, they would cremate the body. They would burn the body, thereby releasing the spirit. That's what they believed. Um, in, in the coins that they put over their eyes, the coins, the Greeks believed that in order for their loved one to get to their final place, their final destination, they had to cross over, their spirit had to cross over the river Styx. But it could not do that unless it, it, it was, uh, it was in, the, in the ferryman, the ferryman would take them across. So in order, to, um, in order to have the ferryman ferry them across the river Styx, you had to pay him something, and that's what the silver coins were for. So you go to the ferryman, Charon, the ferryman, you would give him some, uh, you give him your money, you'd be able to be uh, ferried over to the other side and then reach your final destination. And so in the Greek mindset, the value that they were going for and the way that they did their funeral practices was that they wanted to provide for the continued existence of their loved one, wanted to provide for their eternal life, and wanted to, to help them along to their, you know, in the next stage of their journey right that was what that's what the underlying moral value was for the Greeks well what about the Colossians why did they eat the dead well the Colossians did not believe like the Greeks did they did not believe in the more the immortality of the soul where the soul would exist in a disembodied state from from the body they believed that soul and body are one, and if you allow this, if you allow the body to decompose, then basically that person is gone. They're dead. Their soul is gone. But the best way to help provide for their eternal and continued existence was for their loved ones to eat them, thereby they taking taking that person's body and soul inside of themselves, so that that person's body and soul becomes a part of them, and then can live on through them. And so again, the moral. Value value is, is the same thing as the Greeks. You're trying to provide for the continued existence of your loved one, only they are living on now through you. Uh, so, the, so, so, so Rachel's would say, look, the, both groups have the same set of morality. They have the same moral values. They, they express it somewhat differently, yes. But what's more important, a moral practice or the moral value. And, uh, and, and Rachel says, well, clearly the moral value is what is at the core of uh, what, we're, what we're talking about here. So they really aren't that diverse. In fact, every single culture, Rachel's would make this, uh, make this um, claim, that every, every culture that has ever flourished, that has ever led to any amount of flourishing, has to adopt a, co a common set of moral values or else they don't get off the ground. Uh, this is also an argument that C.S. Lewis makes uh, when he talks about the, uh, this notion. He, he talks about, look, it, you know, moral, moral truth is, uh, is across the board. While we might see differences among cultures, they, they have their, their commonalities are more foundational than their superficial cultural differences. Uh, and, and, and so uh, they have more in common than they do than what's different. Uh, Lewis Pohlman, uh, in his book, brings up the notion of core morality. Uh, core morality basically is the set of moral principles or moral values that every culture recognizes to some degree or another in order to provide for human flourishing. It's a set of core common moral values that every society, no matter how diverse, no matter how primitive or how advanced, no matter how different in terms of uh, culture, every society has to recognize a certain set of common mor core moral values in order to flourish, provide for the flourishing of their society. Uh, now, Poman has a number of them. Uh, let me just list a few of them. He, he lists off, uh, I think, 10 of them or something like that. But just a few of them that we can see pretty obvious, that are pretty obvious. Number one is, is the value of human life. 
There's never been a society in the world that has allowed for human flourishing with, without respecting human life or valuing human life. Now, in every society, there's always a moral way to end human life, uh, such as maybe, maybe a capital punishment or maybe self-defense or something like that. But think about those two, both of those. Capital punishment or and, and self-defense, both of those, the reason that they allow for the taking of human life, on one level anyway, is because they believe that life should be respected. Therefore, if someone is threatening, threatening or actually taking the life of another, they should have. They, they are basically forfeiting their own right to live. Uh, because such a person, if allowed to continue unabated in society, will, will basically wreck the cohesion of society. So they need to be stopped so that life can be preserved and flourishing can be preserved. So the, no, there hasn't been a culture that has got off the ground in, in terms of human flourishing without respecting and valuing human life. That's one, so that's one uh, instance of core morality. Another one would be the value of truth-telling and the value of promise-keeping. Um, the value of truth-telling, this may not be a legal issue, but if people, if, if you, if, if the, per, the you know, every, everybody that you could expect it to meet and talk to in society, if you could not expect that what would come out of their mouth is at least what they believe to be true, uh, in other words, you couldn't tell if they're lying to you or not. Well, then why would we bother talking to people? Because the, the reason that we even bother talking to them is because we assume uh, or we have a good faith investment, uh, a, a, an investment of faith that, they, that they're telling us what at least they believe to be true. So uh, now in a society where truth telling is not valued, then there would, communication would be highly irregular or unlikely, in some cases even impossible. And think about how much in society depends upon communication, uh, whether it's just whether it's the the passing of culture, whether it's the um, whether it's the the the, uh, the teaching of, of how to how to do certain things in order to uh, succeed in life and, and so forth. Education, uh, you know, all these things depend upon the value of truth telling. And if people don't have that value, if a culture doesn't have that value. It doesn't, it doesn't provide for human flourishing, and it, it, will, it will die out. Um, the value of property, uh, people being able to have property and, and accrue property and then uh, put, you know, combine property and so forth, that, that's how we're able to uh, build magnificent buildings and, and, and all this sort of thing. So there are a set of core moral values that every civilization that provides for human flourishing has to recognize. Uh, that's that's known as core morality. Um, it, now, if this is true, if there is a core morality such that Poman argues for and and Rachel's and Lewis all argue for, if that's the case, if there is a set of core moral values that every civilization has to has to recognize, or else it doesn't work, then that would be a strong argument for the notion that there are universal moral principles. Principles that, that exist, moral principles that exist outside of our mind and in some way are reflected in the world around us. Because if the world will not allow your society to function except, if it, except when it recognizes these core moral values, it would seem that that would be a pretty strong argument for universal ethics or a universal moral principle. Uh, so that was, that's one of Rachel's critiques on the diversity thesis. Uh, what about, um, however, what about the, uh, the, the, the dependency thesis? The idea that um, whether an act is right or wrong depends upon the culture within which it takes place. Well, here's the thing about the, de the, the dependency thesis, premise number two in our, our, our argument. Um, if you look real close at that, what you'll find out is that the only way that this is true is if the conclusion of the argument is true. Now, you remember the conclusion of the argument was there's no such thing as universal moral principles. Well, the premise requires that the conclusion to be, for the conclusion to be true in order for it to be true. Uh, so basically, if you, if you sort of reword it a little bit, the, the uh, dependency thesis basically is, is saying what the conclusion says that there's no such thing as universal moral principles. Uh, 
And this is, a, this is a way of restating the conclusion of the argument in the premise that is designed uh, to, to prove the argument. Uh, basically what this is, it's a logical fallacy known as a circular argument, also known as begging the question. Because when you restate the, the, the conclusion in your premise, uh, that, that makes it a logical fallacy. That makes it um, a circular argument. So uh, the, the diversity thesis is, uh, is, is at least dubious. Uh, because even though the, even different cultures even though different cultures may have different moral practices, uh, they probably have very similar moral values. The dependency thesis itself is a circular argument. Therefore, the, the argument that Ruth Benedict advances, the, the diversity thesis, dependency thesis, therefore there is no such thing as universal moral principles, uh, the argument itself is very fallacious. Um, and the premises do not prove the conclusion. Now that doesn't mean that subjective ethical relativism, I'm sorry, conventional ethical relativism is wrong. That just means that it cannot be proved by that argument. Uh, now, James Rachel is a critic of conventional ethical relativism. Uh, he's a critic, and uh, he so he notes the issues with Benedict's um, her formula there. But then he goes on to say, "Okay, let's just step back for a second here, and let's examine conventional relativism in a different light. Let's do this. Let's let's assume that it's true." And then let's follow, uh, it, assume that it's true, and then follow the, 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 the thought pattern through to its logical conclusion. This is known as an argumentum ad absurdum. Argumentum ad absurdum. It's basically the idea where you're, to analyze a thought or a theory, what you do is you, you assume that the theory is true, and then you see what, the theory, what consequences the theory implies. And that's what he says. He says, you know what? What if we take conventional ethical relativism seriously? What if we say, yeah, okay, I'll take it seriously. Now what? What are some of the practical out outcomes? What are the practical consequences? What, uh, what's the logical end if we follow down this, this train of thought? Um, and Rachel's, Rachel's um, start, he begins his critique by noting several different consequences or implications of conventional ethical relativism. We're going to look at three of them. And at the end of looking at them, we, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to live with these implications? If we consider ourselves to uh, espouse conventional ethical relativism, are we willing to live with these various, uh, with these various consequences of the, of the idea? Uh, and so let's, look at, let, let's go ahead and look at those. Well, in order to see the first implication of the thought process of conventional ethical relativism, let's, let's uh, take, for example, the practice of sati. The practice of sati. Now, what is the practice of sati? Well, a, a couple hundred years ago in India, the Indian people had this practice. It's a funeral practice uh, that, the, that they often performed. And it was, it was typically done most, most especially among the more wealthy people, but also it, it was done um, by, by others as well. The practice of sati was basically this, that when a man died, he would be cremated, but he would be cremated um, on his pyre. He, he would include, it, it would have included some of his prized possessions. So whatever it was, maybe he had a, a prized walking stick or a prized chair that he sat in, whatever the case may be, whatever it was that he had that people sort of associated that thing with him, it would be put on the funeral pyre with him. Well, one of the things that was inevitably put on the funeral pyre with him was his wife, who was still very much alive. Uh, and so, so the widows were often burned um, at, at the funeral pyre of their husband. Uh, burned alive. Now, some of them went willingly because they, they held it a high honor to do this. Others, however, had to be coerced into it. They had to be either knocked unconscious uh, and tied or restrained uh, in, in this sort of thing. And this was a horrific practice that had gone on for centuries. Uh, but when European missionaries came to India and, and uh, started making inroads into the culture and things, and seeing some of the things that they had done, uh, 
uh, they, they came across this practice and they were just absolutely horrified at this, at this thing, especially, especially because, uh, because India was a very patriarchal society. And in many cases, uh, a man's wife might be 20, 30 years younger than he. And so whereas he might, might have died of old age, uh, she still has plenty of life left in her and she doesn't want to die. Um, and, and she's forcibly coerced into, into uh, being burned alive, basically. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the um, European missionaries saw this and they, stro they strove to put an end to it, and they did eventually. Uh, now, they weren't the only ones that were horrified. There were many in India who also were horrified at this. Uh, but they, uh, they were the ones who really rallied to put an end to the practice. Uh, but what about that practice? What about that practice of sati, the burning of widows along with their husbands? Well, um, here's the deal uh, with, with sati. Uh, how would conventional ethical relativism deal with this? Well, conventional relativism would say, look, there, there's two cultures at play here. Uh, on the one hand, there's the Indian culture, which approves of sati uh, and has approved of it by and large for several centuries. Um, on the other hand, there's this, there's this European missionary culture that, that disapproves of sati uh, and, and, and uh, does so very vehemently. They, they can't stand it. They, they're very opposed to it morally. You've got two cultures who are coming together on this issue. And if you're, if you're in the European culture, the, then you're looking outside of your culture. Keep in mind, you're actually in India. With the, you are in, implanted or embedded in the Indian culture. And, uh, and, and you're seeing this in, take place in that context. It's not like they came to your house and tried to do it. They're, they are where they're supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, conventional relativism would say, look, you have no right or you have no basis then to claim that your culture's values are superior to others. And that really is the first outworking uh, that Rachel's mentions when it comes to, when it comes to um, taking uh, conventional relativism seriously. It, basically, it's this. You can no longer claim that your culture's morals are superior to any other culture. Uh, because why? Well, because you represent two different, uh, almost hermetically sealed cultures who each one of you are doing what you believe to be right within the context of your own culture. And remember that there's no overarching moral law between the two cultures. In order for us to say that, to, to look at another culture and say that that culture, what they're doing is wrong, we have to have a common moral law that, that, that binds both of us. Uh, and, and that we can look at the moral law and we could look at the practice in the other culture and say, well, according to that moral law that applies to both us and them, they're wrong. Well, in cultural relativism or conventional ethical relativism, you don't have that. You don't have that overarching binding moral law that brings you both together. You don't, you, the, the, uh, the conventional relativism doesn't, doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for that. So, uh, so you, since, you, since you don't have that overarching moral law by which both of you can be judged, and all you have is the moral law of the culture, since the moral law of the culture, let's say the Indian culture, says that sati is okay, then who are we to pass judgment on that? That's what conventional relativism would say. Um, and so, uh, and so we, we lose the ability to critique other cultures. And you might say, well, that's okay. Uh, I can live with that. Okay, maybe you can. But keep in mind, there are some pretty bad things people have done in different cultures. Uh, for example, are we, really willing, are we really willing to sit back and say that female circumcision is, is okay in the cultures where that takes place? I mean, in the United States, it's illegal for anybody prior to age 18, regardless of parental consent. You can't have it done. Um, but in other cultures across the world, it's, it's moral. It's been practiced for years, and it's okay in that culture. Are, is that okay? Is it okay to do that to a, a little girl, uh, to, to, to mutilate her like that? Or what about the practice of um, marrying 13-year-olds or 12-year-olds? That happens across in the world. Is Marrying them off to 40-something-year-old men, uh, is that okay? 
um, or uh, the practice of slavery, because that still happens in the world and it's still morally acceptable in some places in the world. Is that okay? Um, are we really willing to sit back and say that, well, they do what they're doing, that's fine with us? Um, well, what about, what about the Nazis? Uh, because what they did in their culture was perfectly legal. They had passed the laws and they could relocate the Jewish people and they could euthanize them, basically, what they called it. Um, are we really willing to say, to, to, to give up the ability to, 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 to uh, critique moral practices of, of, of other cultures? Because that's what we would have to do. We would have no basis for that if, um, if, we, don't, if we don't have a common moral law that binds both of us. Well, that's, uh, that's number one. We can no longer claim that our culture's morals are superior to any other. Um, the, second, the second practical outworking that Rachel's mentions is this. If we take conventional ethical relativism seriously, then we cannot say that we, in our, in our context, have progressed morally, that we have made moral progress. And I think um, if you can live with the first one, this one may be a little bit more difficult because I think it would be difficult for us to say that we have not made moral progress in the last 200 years. Let's say, for example, on the issue of slavery. Uh, 200 years ago, the United States, uh, the in, in the United States, slavery was legal. Now, there are still slaves in the United States nowadays. There are more slaves, in fact, now than there ever have been in history. But, of course, there are more people now than there ever have been in history as well. Uh, the percentage of slaves is down considerably from what, uh, you know, as opposed to the general population. But, uh, but at least, he, here's the thing, 200 years ago, slavery was, was uh, morally acceptable to many people in our, in our society. Not only was it acceptable, but you, you could find places throughout the United States where politicians would build their platform on being pro-slavery. Now, could you imagine somebody trying to do that today? That just wouldn't happen. Why not? Well, because the vast majority of people are against slavery. Uh, so we've made some progress in that area. Certainly, we could make more progress in that area. That's without a doubt. But, uh, but nonetheless, there has been, there, there, there's been a change, and the change, I would like to think, is for the better, at least in some, to some degree. Here's the thing, though. If, uh, if we were to take cultural relativism seriously, then what happens? Well, then what happens is this. What happens is that we have, a, we have again, two different cultures. They're separated not by geography this time. They're separated by chronology. They're separated by time. It's the same geography two different, in two different periods in time. And so the early, we have, we have the, the United States in the early 1800s and in the United States in the early 21st century. So, uh, so we have two different cultures that we're dealing with here that are separated by time and they're separated by their cultural persuasion. They just, they just are. And, and unless we have some sort of moral law that binds both of these cultures together, then we cannot, we cannot say that one is better than the other on the basis of that moral law. If the moral law is not there, and the only thing that we have to go on is the moral law present, or the, the, the cultural conventions, the moral conventions that we have in our own culture, uh, our culture tells us that this is good and this is bad, this is right and this is wrong. If that's all that we have to go on, then, then, uh, then we, can't, we, we don't have a basis to say that they were worse than us. We don't have a basis to say that they were better than us. All that we can say is that we're different, and that difference is, doesn't make a difference, really. Uh, think about this. What, how, how have things changed for women in the United States in the last 200 years? Uh, 200 years ago, women couldn't vote. 200 years ago, m most women didn't own property. 200 years ago, um, women didn't, most women didn't get educated. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, um, you know, they, they didn't have jobs and, and all kinds of things. So, so uh, fast forward now to the 21st century, and not only do women do all of these things or have all of these, these, these uh, benefits, uh, but they are in some places leading the, in, in these areas. Uh, 
Uh, and so, I mean, there are more women in college today than there are men. Uh, that's just statistically a fact. Uh, and so, um, and so what we see is that, uh, is that, yeah, progress has been made. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have any more progress that could, you know, that, that couldn't be made. It simply means that, that progress has been made. But the only way that we can say that progress has been made is if we have a moral law that is common to both that culture and our culture that overarches both of us so that we can look at that moral law and see if they meet it better than we do. And if they meet it better than we do, or if th then we would say that they're better and we've gotten worse. Or if they don't meet it as well as we do, then we say that we're, we're better and we've progressed. But that's the only way that we can say that we've progressed morally, is if we have that common moral law. Well, in conventional ethical relativism, you don't have that common moral law. The only thing that you have is a moral law that is present within both cultures. That's all. That's it. You've got a moral law in, in, in today's culture and a moral law in yesterday's culture. And uh, what's right today is right for today. What's right for, yes, for, for back then was right for back then. Uh, so you, you can't say that we've, we're better or worse. We, we haven't made moral progress um, if we take cultural relativism seriously, conventional relativism seriously. Well, that's number two. So the first one is we lose a basis to critique other cultures. The second one is that we lose a basis to critique our own culture to see if we've gotten better or gotten worse. And if you can live with both of those, the third one I think is probably the most scathing critique that Rachel's offers yet. And that is this. If we take conventional ethical relativism seriously, then we the, then initiating moral progress in our own culture is itself immoral. If we take conventional ethical relativism seriously, then initiating moral progress in our own culture is itself immoral. Now, why would initiating moral progress in our own culture make us immoral? Well, it's the same thing. Because what we're really dealing with here is, again, two different cultures. We've got the culture that we currently live in, or the society that we currently live in, and then we have, uh, then we have an ideal society, one that we picture in our mind that is not the one that we live in, but it's the one that we're hoping one day to live in. And, and we believe that the one that we're hoping to live in one day is better than where we're at right now. <clears throat> so we have our culture versus the ideal culture, our society versus the ideal society. And the principle is the same. The only way that we can say that they are that, that the ideal society would be better than our current society is if there is a moral law that is transcendent over both of us, that connects both of us, so that we can look at the moral law and we can look at the ideal society and we can say they meet the requirements of the moral law better than we do, therefore we need to pro progress to that, right? We need to go there. We need to do things like they would do them. Um, uh, that, that's the only way, is if we have that common moral law. But in cultural relativism, in conventional relativism, we don't have that common moral law that overarches both of us, that transcends both of us. The only moral law that we have is the one in our society. And here's the catch. If we are thinking about doing anything different than the moral law in our society, then we are the ones breaking the moral law or suggesting breaking the moral law. Um, think about, for example, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he gave his I Have a Dream speech. And uh, you're probably familiar with that. Uh, this, is, this is all, uh, so, so basically what was he doing there? He was saying, look, I have a dream that one day people will be judged, for example, by the, by the, the, the content of their character and not the color of their skin. <clears throat> that, that was his dream. His dream was to live in a world where racism was not a thing. But the world that he actually lived in, racism was a thing. Now, here's, here it is. So, so if Martin Luther King Jr. Is, is living in a world where racism exists, and that world says, that society says, that, that, that racism is a morally permissible thing to do, then if you were to try to reform it by saying no, the morally better thing to do would have no racism. Basically, you're going against the, the, the accepted 
uh, more, the accepted moral law in, in, in that culture at that time, and you, you are yourself there, thereby being immoral. You're being immoral. Now, that's not what Dr. King believed, though. You see, Dr. King believed that there was a moral law that transcended our culture, and that it was possible to make an unjust law. Well, if, you have, if it's possible to make an unjust law, then that would seem to, that would mean that there is a a moral law that is higher than our law to by which our law might be judged well in cultural relativism you don't have that higher moral law you don't have that transcendent moral law all that you have is the moral law as it is found um, in your culture in that culture said racism was okay um, so uh, so when when dr king says, I have a dream to live in a society where racism has been eradicated. He's going against the, 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 the cultural conventions, the moral conventions of his day. He's the one that's being immoral if we take cultural relativism seriously. Now, I think that's a pretty scathing uh, critique of cultural relativism. <clears throat> All the more scathing because it's actually true. If you have no higher law to appeal to, then you can't say that your society is bad and needs to change. And if you do say your society is bad and needs to change, you're violating the moral law in your society. And that's the only moral law there is, then you, then you yourself are being immoral. Um, that's, I think that's a pretty scathing critique, and I think all the more so because I don't think there's a person watching this video who, if they were given an opportunity, wouldn't change something about our society. I, don't, I, I know I would. If I were given the opportunity, I would definitely change some things about our society and what we see as moral and what we see as immoral. I imagine you probably would as well. Now, we may not agree on what those issues are, and we may not agree about which direction we need to change. We may disagree on those things, but I, but I believe that everybody thinks that we could be doing better in some way. <clears throat> now, if you are not completely happy with the status quo, in, in, in your attempt to change the status quo, um, you would be actually immoral. You see, Dr. King didn't believe that, he didn't believe in cultural relativism. He didn't accept that. Dr. King, uh, in his letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, believed that. He said basically that there are unjust laws, that our society has, uh, has unjust laws. And, he, and you ask him, well, how do you tell if a law is unjust? And this is what he said. He said, an unjust law is a man-made law that does not square with the law of nature or the law of God. An unjust law is a man-made law that does not square with the law of nature or law of God. Now think about that statement for just a minute. What he's saying <clears throat> is that our society has made a bunch of man-made laws. And some of those man-made laws are good and fine and proper and okay. But there are some of those man-made laws that that do not reflect the nature, the law of nature or the law of God. Now, what is he talking? He's talking about a law that transcends our man-made laws. And that's that, that's that moral law that he believed in that transcended all cultures. And if a culture were to make a law that violated that, that, man, uh, violated that natural law or the law of God, then that, then that man-made law is, is an unjust law and it's immoral. Uh, he, he believed in a transcendent morality. He believed in a transcendent ethic. And because of that, that's how he carried on his, his fight for civil rights. All right, well, that's uh, conventional ethical relativism. And uh, we, will, we will move from here to uh, ethical objectivism for the next video. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much.